I want to teach Roblox NPCs how to do parkour. And in order to do that, we're going to get a bunch of them, put them to the test, and only the best will survive. Like that guy. This guy, he's doing a really good job. And the coolest thing about this whole system is that I actually didn't program any of them to do this. I put up the mechanics, I made the system, but these Roblox NPCs are evolving on their own. I'm taking the ones who are the best, who are able to do the most jumps, and then they are surviving and reproducing and moving on to the next generation. So I'm basically simulating like natural selection and evolution within Roblox Studio, which is pretty cool. And this system is not just specific to Roblox. This is called a genetic algorithm, and it's a way of machine learning, just like how artificial neural networks and like reinforcement learning, this is another way to teach machines how to find solutions to problems that you set up. So in this video, I'm going to show you the specifics on how this thing works, why it works the way it does, and some insights we can gather from it. And then also, I will have the code in the description for you to play around with and to maybe expand this to a more complex system. And you can maybe even turn this into a game if you really wanted to. So let's jump right in and let's look at the specifics of this genetic evolution simulation in Roblox. In order to simplify this problem, we first start by transitioning our 3D view of the Roblox world into a 2D one for our Roblox NPC, just to make the problem a little bit more easy to approach. And then from there, we start at the uh, character's midsection, and then we project rays downward and then up, rotating every couple of degrees to give them a couple of rays to detect their environment. So we take each of these rays, and then we take the distance until it hits something and divide that by the overall distance the ray can travel. So like right here, this is how far the ray will travel. And all three of these rays like here will give you a value of one since they reach their complete path without hitting anything. This one over here might give you a value like 0.7 or something like that because it is 0.7 of the way to completely traversing the entire path. So if all of the NPCs are receiving the same input from their rays, then what leads to the variation? Well, this is where their genes come in. So what exactly are genes? So as humans, we all have genes. It's what tells us the color of our eyes, It what describes like some of the, our mannerisms and things like that. And the way we store our genes is through DNA. So this is like a very crappy drawing of what DNA could look like. It has like a double helix, and each one of these lines in the double helix is a specific molecule or protein that sort of defines and codes what your body should look like, how it should work, etc. And it's just a bunch, it's like a bunch of little letters, so it's like T, G, C, A, or something like that. And then they're ordered in a different order, and that is what describes your specific genome. So we want to replicate this sort of system since we are trying to replicate biology, but in our case, we're going to be using an array of numbers. So this is a basic array with numbers from negative 1 to 1. And so what basically happens is each one of the rays that we just saw, so let me get a array. So each one of these rays, like this is an example of array, it would have a two values corresponding to it in the genome. It would have like one of these, for example, and then one of these. So each one of these controls a different thing. So we take this value that the ray produces. So let's say, let's go back to our other example, and this ray produces a value of like 0 0.7. We take this, we multiply it by the value in the genome. So in this case, it would just be 0 0.7. And in this case, it would be a negative 0.35. And then these each correspond to the like finalized weight. And the reason we're using two is one's for move, and this is whether or not it moves forward, and one's for jump, whether or not it jumps. Now the move one, honestly, like in hindsight, isn't really consequential at all because 
they almost always move forward, like regardless of the situation. But if we were to change this to three dimensions, moving and the vector that describes the moving would be very consequential since that kind of determined where you're going. The jump, the jumping is a more important one. So since we have a bunch of rays, each of these rays has reserved two values in our little array. Now we could have made this an array of arrays with each ray having its own array and rays. That's getting kind of complicated. But each ray has its own like set of values. But this is just easier to work with within the code, even though it may be less intuitive to learn. So from here, we can take all these values and like we take all of them from here on out too. And then we can just sum them all up. We can sum up all the move ones. So this will be like a move sum. And then we can sum up all the jump ones and we get a jump sum. And this of course is taking all of the values from the rest of them as well and putting them all together. And then what we do with these is we check if the move sum is greater than zero or if the jump and, and if or the jump sum is greater than zero we we move and or jump so these are independent of each other if the move sum is greater than zero we move if the jump sum is greater than zero we jump and that's really all we need for the situation because the npcs can only move basically in like one and a half dimensions they can move forward and then it can jump which is kind of like binary like on or off and same with the move and the most important part of this system is that the genes are randomized. They're randomized to begin with, and they're randomized as the simulation goes on. This way, we get variation. And the variation leads to different weights that allow the NPC to jump at different times, depending on what happens. But then what exactly do we do with the NPCs in the end? So we give them a fitness score, of course. We give them a score, because who doesn't love grades? But the way this works is here you can see we have a bunch of little platforms representing platforms and the goal would probably be like somewhere like over here probably this is where they want to get to we give them a score based on their distance from the goal position so we're basically ha like having an imaginary ruler from zero to however far it's possible to be away from the goal and we score them so, so for example an npc here would have a higher score than one over here so lower scores are better in our case here. And then that allows us to sort who did good and who did bad, which allows us to continue on the simulation. So once we have found their scores, we can now sort the scores. And then what, what we're going to do with them is split them in half. We take the best scores and we get rid of the bad scores because these scores are bad enough where there's no point to keep them. So we keep these parents within the gene, gene pool, but then we also perform some crossover to get children from these parents that may or may not be a little better than the parents. So we pair up the parents, and these fitness scores have their genes like you know encapsulated within them respectively. So for example, this one and this one would make like two children, and same with these two. They would mate and then make two children. So how exactly does that process work? So if we go down here, we have two separate genes. They're both kind of random. We pick a point along their gene or an index, and then we cut it in half. So for example here, this, this is called the crossover point because this whole point of the genetic algorithm process is called the crossover step because we're going to cross over this part of the gene here with this part of the gene here. So we take this part, move it down to where this part is, and then move this part up here, like that. So we would effectively swap the gene, the first half of the genes with each other, creating two new children who may or may not have better attributes than their parents. So the goal with this is to take the best of both worlds. You take the best of one parent and the best of other parent. And, you know, the thing is, is it's all random. So hopefully we'll get the best. Sometimes we won't, but sometimes we'll get lucky and we will. And that's the whole point of this entire process. We're throwing a bunch of NPCs a bunch of times over and over again. And our goal is to get it so that these children can outperform their parents in terms of their fitness score to eventually get to our solution, 
which is reaching the goal, the all-encompassing solution. So that's all we want to get. And then, additionally, along with reproduction, there's also a chance that one of these genes will have a mutation. So a mutation would be, for example, we took this 0.9, and then we took it, it was mutated into a 0.7 or something like that. So a mutation is basically where we change a single index to a different value. And this is for genes, gene pools that are stagnating or gene pools that need to adapt to the population. So for example, if in our evolution simulation, the MPC is not able to reach the end in like a very long time, hopefully mutation, which has like a 0.5% chance, so it has a 0.05 probability of occurring, it will, by chance, change a gene in order for an organism to survive a lot better, which is the goal. So it's pretty rare, but when it does happen, it most of the time leads to bad results, but it can sometimes lead to good results, which is that that's all we need. We need that little guarantee that the gene pool will adapt regardless of the situation. So this entire process I've described here is one generation. So we take this process, we spawn them in with their genes, and, we, and then we find, take their fitness scores, we find the best, we reproduce them, and then we may or may not mutate. We repeat this many, many, many times. So we keep on repeating this generation process for as many generations as you want. In my specific simulation, it was set to something like, like 25 generations, which seemed to converge on a solution pretty nicely. But depending on your situation, you may need more, you may need less. And the reason we have this generational process is so over time, the weights, the better weights survive, they're able to reproduce. They produce children that may or may not win out the parents. And if they do beat the parents in terms of their fitness score, they'll reproduce and it'll keep on going over and over. The cycle will continue. We'll start with a bunch of like the initial population. They'll move on. Some of them will get killed and then more will come in. And it just keeps on going like that until we have reach 25 generations, which at that point we should have almost all of the organisms surviving and getting a very low score. So most of the time, like the lowest score they can get is like 0.07 or something as their fitness score, which is pretty optimal. Like that's their goal. They need to get to that point and they did it and they did it quite well. And that's all we can ask of them really, because they're not really smart. I should, probably shouldn't be asking them anything. But since the ones who by chance happen to have the right genes and the right weights in order to survive, they're the ones that live on and reproduce. And so this describes how natural selection works in nature. Like, you know, you see the, see the diagram of evolution with like the, the apes and then the human slowly standing on two feet. This is that situation. So we start out with some very primitive little organisms, you can call them that don't really know what to do. But then over time, because of their environment, their environment in this case is the platforms that the NPCs have to jump on. Because of their environment, they're able to adapt to the situation and evolve weights that allow them to survive. And nature survival is a multi, like multi-parameter. It has a bunch of different things. You need, you need your food, you need your food, you need like your water, and you need a bunch of other things like like shelter too, right? You need a bunch of other things in order to survive. And this process that I described in Roblox can sort of give you an insight on how that might all work over a long scale. And you'll notice that evolution in real life happens over thousands, if not millions of years. That's one of the biggest downsides to a genetic algorithm like this. It takes a long time because you have to go through generation after generation. But these algorithms give you very creative solutions that humans may, may not have otherwise have thought of. Now, for this specific example, that's not the case. The jumping is quite simple, but this is just a stepping stone to more complex examples. So let's now watch the simulation again with the insight I've given you a little bit earlier. So we start off with the initial generation. They're all random. This guy just happened to have good genes, which is kind of rare. And this right here is the goal, and this other block over here is a start. 
You can see a lot of them are being kind of stupid and they're not jumping properly. Some of them are just standing there. So these guys get no, like basically no fitness score. And you can see in the uh, bottom, I have all the generations listed and it's printing out the best fitness score. So it starts off with an infinite fitness score because generation one, like any like anything can do better than like anything before generation one because there's nothing before that. But then over time, it goes from nine to 0.2 to 0.1 to 0 0.04. So they continually get better. You can see more and more of them are jumping. They're all different colors, but they're like kind of inside of each other. And there's still a couple guys here. There's a couple stragglers. But then over time, they all they all go away. So all of the dummies have learned how to run and jump. And occasionally, there's a mutation, which in this case, the mutation wasn't very good because, you know, it kind of caused them to, like, jump down early and die. But sometimes when... They get stuck here, they get stuck down there. A mutation allows the entire population to start like learning how to jump properly. It's all just dependent. And the thing about this is it's very dependent on random chance, but since we repeat stuff like this so often, like with many generations, and I think I'm running, actually let me check, I'm running a good amount of organisms. So I have 25 generations with 32 dummies per generation, or 32 NPCs per generation. So that's enough to kind of use random chance to your advantage and get the best solutions out of this problem right here. And as far as machine learning goes, genetic algorithms are pretty approachable. So I have here the script that I used to write this, which is like 230 lines, heavily commented, and it will be in the description in case you want to check it out. And the cool thing is, is I've liked this enough that this was, wasn't actually my first attempt at making a genetic algorithm. I actually made one using a pretty contrived example once again, and Python. So in this example, the little squares have to move to a the zone over here. And they're a little more complex than our Roblox NPCs. They actually have brains. So this is an example of their brain evolving over time. You can see they all go to the side. And genetic algorithms can be actually used for useful stuff too. They've been used in engineering to find optimal solutions to like aerodynamic problems. They've been used in scheduling apps of all things to like figure out like the best schedules. And they're just very good for situations that involved a lot of like interesting and ingenious solutions that other algorithms may not come up on. And yeah, that's about it for this video. So I hope you enjoyed learning about genetic algorithms and how I implemented one in Roblox. And I encourage you to look at my code, expand it, try to make it like 3D or try to make it, you know, something cool like that. Because this is cool. It can be a lot cooler though. And as a side note, I know I did make a poll asking if, if I should do like vector animations or just like drawing. And I ended up doing drawing even though the, in the poll vector animations kind of won out because I feel like I could do a better job explaining and it would be a lot less time consuming because vector animations are cool and flashy but they're a lot they're very impersonal and they're they take a long time to set up as opposed to just drawing because that is a little more interactive a little more fun to me and hopefully more fun to you but make sure to put your feedback on that in the description and like the video if you enjoyed it subscribe to my channel for more Roblox scripting content and cool stuff like this and ask any questions down in the comments. But other than that, I hope you have a nice day, and goodbye.